Hey, what's up, you guys? It's Dove Cameron. I just did an interview on the Zach Sang Show, and we talked about probably literally everything. <laughs> everything <laughs> under the sun ever that's ever existed. Um, and things that actually don't yet exist. So tune in. We love you. Hello, beautiful human. Thank you so much for clicking on our conversation with Dove Cameron. This is an incredibly special one to me. She is so special. I've wanted to have her on the show for literally years. I, I am a massive fan, and I can't, can't wait to get into it. And today's interview with Dove is being delivered to you by GoPuff. Come on. GoPuff completes me. Wherever I go, GoPuff bags follow me. It's just how I live. I, I use them constantly to get whatever I need, from candles to energy drinks to water, everything in my life comes to me courtesy of GoPuff. It is the ultimate convenience store, home to thousands of items, items that you may need. I mean, you're gonna order from somewhere anyway, so why not order from GoPuff? They'll literally show up to your home, or to your studio, or they'll meet you on a street corner pretty much instantly. They met me on a street corner one time in Atlanta, Georgia, with a Celsius energy drink and a toothbrush. They saved my life. So let GoPuff help you out. And I'll help you out, too. I'll save you $10 off your first two orders if you use the code ZAC10. ZAC10 will save you $10 off your first two orders. Go Puff. It's great. Go Puff is amazing. I, I, honestly, I, I love them. They've changed the way I live. And everyone's going to order something from somewhere. So just go Puff it. Just see how easy it is. And let me know how your experience is. ZAC10 will save you $10 off your first two orders. Happy Go Puffin'. And uh, here's Dove. If I'm like ever really fucked, I have to watch um, either Bo Burnham's Inside or uh, Joker with Joaquin Phoenix. Interesting. Which is like the two ends of the spectrum. I would love to unpack why the <laughs> Joker makes you feel whole you and know, at home. Because you know what it is? I actually have figured this out. I think that the Joker, I was talking to my family about this the other night, I think that Joaquin Phoenix is the Joker is like a weird Rorschach litmus test mm. for empathy. Because I think if you watch it and you're like, ew, scary, ew, make me feel sick, then it's like you don't understand that that could be any of us if we were mistreated. And then if you watch it and you're oh. like, oh, I feel brought back to myself, like, wow, how disturbing and how informative, then you understand the human condition. You understand that you're as fragile as anybody. So, by the way, hi, beautiful human. I'm Zach. That's Santa. We welcome to the studio for the hey. first time ever. Dove Cameron. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, let's, uh, I want to dive into that. Okay. Why are you watching it to remind yourself of what? Joker? Yeah. Um... I think it's funny. I didn't know we were rolling before, so I was much more eloquent. <laughs> the second the camera goes on, I'm like, uh, I've never had a thought in my life. Um, good thing I, I'm you'll, only ever on camera for my job. You'll, uh, for, you'll forget that they're here. Okay, okay. I am. Um, I think that the reason. I think the reason that the Joker brings me back to myself is because a Joaquin Phoenix's performance is so intimate and disturbing and human that it's like really. Um, what is that word like voyeuristic like you feel like you're really watching a real human being which so much of the time as an actor when I watch movies I'm so aware that it's a fucking movie that I I get taken out of it because I'm like thinking about the shots I'm thinking about all these different things and the choices that someone's making but you just watch him and you're like oh my god wow I'm really watching this very fragile and very like um innocent mind like I think when you watch the Joker if you don't relate to him there's like <laughs> this is gonna be bad sounding but maybe not i think if you don't relate to like the fragility of a character like that and you don't understand that all of our psyches if they were treated the wrong way would end up in a similar position um then there are parts of you that you are like not familiar with like i feel like people who have done like shadow work and they know like they're darker um places that they could go if they weren't taking care of themselves mentally or physically or anything like that then um, they won't relate to something like that. This is getting crazy. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? I, I understand it. Yeah, I think that like you, if if you watch characters like the Joker and you and you feel alienated by them, um, then you don't know how similar we all are as a human race. And then if you watch it and you're like, oh wow, I feel deep empathy for that person, and you relate in small ways, then I think you you have empathy for everyone. That's so. Do you want to be reminded that you have empathy in those moments? Do you feel like you lose that? No, I think I just, I, I think I have an issue with my own humanity on the whole, like in many, many different ways. 
Um, and I think that being reminded of how fragile I am and being reminded that I'm a human being and I could be easily affected by environments or anything like that, like really brings me back. And also I think I think there's something about movies like Joker where it's so volatile and it's so gut wrenching that it like brings me back to earth. Whereas mm. so much content these days is created with this sort of like level of like distracto dust <laughs> to like distract us from our real lives and, and social media and like all these things. Like it's just stimulation. And so when something is made that is as ugly and as human as Joker, um, it like reminds me of like what it means to be here and be present and be alive. You know, it's like it's not it's not a film that you watch to deny reality. I think that's what a lot of dark films do for me. Knowing that your environment could affect your mental health and who you become as a person at any moment in time. Yeah. How do you curate the perfect environment or is that even possible? I'm working on that so so purposefully right now. I'm being very I've, I'm being very intentional about figuring out what that means for myself because um I was actually speaking to my best friend about this last night. I think that um I think that I am like very, very, I, I've realized recently, I think I'm avoidant in a way that I really wasn't aware of before because I think I really love human beings and I, I really have a lot of trauma and I really uh, find emotion comfortable. So I was always like, I can't be avoidant. I'm so emotional. I'm so in touch with myself. I'm so in touch with others. I fall in love so easily. But I'm avoidant in all kinds of other ways that I didn't really realize so much of that. I'm, I'm a total workaholic. Mm -hmm. I hate to sleep because it's like, like I always say, like if I if I could just never sleep again, I'd be so happy because I like I love life. I love stimulus. I love the mornings. I love the nights. I love the afternoons. I love 3 a.m. Like I love life. But I think so much of that go, go, go is me being unable to sit with what happens when things turn off. Um, You're more comfortable when it's on. Oh, yeah, Even totally. if on means running out of fuel eventually. Even when on means running myself into the ground, which I almost always am. And I'm kind of in a constant state of like... Running, 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 crashing, recovering. Totally always covering, again. always covering. Like I, I, I look at... Sometimes I'm, it's like that NASCAR, like you're like patching yourself up with duct tape and like oil's leaking and you're like, just go. And I feel like I definitely live my life like that. And I didn't really realize that that's like a trauma coping mechanism, hmm. um, even though it's like super textbook. But I think you're like blind to your own bullshit. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. No yeah. matter how clear it may be, it could punch you in the face literally every day. Yeah. Until somebody else punches you in the face with it. Oh, I'm diagnosing other people with this all the time. <laughs> and I'm like... <laughs> I'm like, I don't know why I just intuitively know this about you and not me. <laughs> not me. I'm adjusted. Um, <laughs> but so I'm trying to figure that out right now. I'm trying to figure out like, you know, I'm in my 20s. I want to, I want to, what is that quote? Like you want to create a life that you don't have to routinely escape from. And, you know. Do you feel like you're escaping? I think I always thought because I lived so much life all the time and I am so emotional that those two things together meant I was never escaping. I was like ultra present. That's what I thought. Um, but I think so much of that is there's like this horrible, horrible objectifying monster in my head. It's like, I can do anything. Just say yes to everything. You'll figure it out as you go. You don't have feelings or needs. And there's like a lack of intimacy that actually ever since I've been writing music a lot more, I've been confronted with a lot more because I'm like, Ooh, I really hate writing about like my most honest humanity. And it's not because I'd care about what anybody else thinks. I probably think that if someone else were to dive into my brain, I'd feel safer. It's, it's about what I think about me. Is that what you're afraid will come when you turn off? I it must be. It must be. Because and like I'm sure that we'll get into this, but like I grew up with just so many macro and micro doses of trauma. Yeah that I think I there were so many things that I was probably just too young to process and so I just like slapped a bunch of duct tape on and, and just kind of kept going and and I'm an adult now and I'm like ooh, okay like it's, it's time to open up. that up again yeah can I ask do you wear a locket on you today I don't have it on me today no but I do have it at home you, there's a story and a significance behind the locket that I, I you know 
in doing research about you, I was really moved oh, this morning. Thank you. And correct me if I'm wrong here. Your dad would give you a locket every year for your birthday, mm-hmm. starting yeah. with the day you were born. Uh huh. Yeah. And you ha- you've collected these lockets, mm-hmm. but you lost your dad incredibly early. Yeah. Where do you keep these lockets? Um, I have a bunch of. It's like a. <laughs> it's like a little locket relic boneyard i have i actually was i was pawing through my jewelry this morning my my parents used to um run a jewelry company so i have like messes of jewelry boxes and like different ones that mean different things but all the lockets have their own little special box yeah i uh i don't really wear them as much anymore i think because and this is always an interesting thing to talk about because everybody has you know a lot of opinions on death and loss and family and all this but I uh, I lost my dad at such a such a pivotal age that I really it was really like a strange thing for my identity. Like I think I had an arrested development identity for a while um, when I was like first in the public eye. I was very much like trying to be something that I thought I was because I just like couldn't be present to who I was becoming. Because if I was present, that would mean I was dealing with the loss of my father in a way that I wasn't ready to. So I was doing a lot of like performing in a way that I didn't know I was 15. You know, like I had no idea who I was or or what was me or what wasn't or what was like carrying on for the good of the company and my family. And then what was like denial. Like it was just a whole hornet's nest of like trauma and being on camera and like bleaching my hair and trying to just like be okay when you were working back then who were you working for was it for you or for your family oh me no that that was that's one thing i can always always um feel very grateful for is my family would have supported me no matter what i did i didn't have like a stage family it was always me um but i definitely think i like delved into the industry in a serious way to escape like (laughs) what life looked like um at 15 and like I was the I never ever wanted to leave set like you know I just found more safety in work and being someone else yeah and also like being a part of a family that felt like a family that that then wasn't really your family because if they're really your family in my mind it was like oh they can die at any time but if you have like a projected cast family there's like a kind of a safe bubble in you that you separate from them at a certain point so you don't have to suffer that loss yeah and as well you can kind of like suspend disbelief and pretend you have this like perfect american family when that was like very very far from what i had but i um i definitely think that my best friend said something to me once when I was like, dude, I'm tired. This is like a year ago. And she was like, I mean, you you haven't taken a break since you were like 14. And I was like, that's not true. And she was like, yes, it is. <laughs> and I was like, oh, shit, that's true. Like, I, I just, I kind of started working when I was a child and, you know, didn't go to therapy nearly as much as I should. And then just kind of like never, never stopped and never took stock of like, you know, it's like not checking on like... <laughs> I don't know, food, food, and then being like, oh, it went bad. It's like, yeah, of course it went bad. Like, you left it for but 10 years. This goes back to you just keep going, 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 because yeah. you never want it to turn off. Yeah. It's true. And so so to answer your question that you asked me like 20 minutes ago, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, I'm working actively on integrating things that feel, you know, things that are like, things that feed my soul because mm-hmm. I realize that it's not the physical output of my job that exhausts me. It's the um, lack of spiritual well filling that like when I when I do some like one thing for a really long time with no variation or I'm only doing things that feel like they take and they don't give or there's no human connection, which is really the reason I started doing all of this anyways, because I like worship at the altar of humans. Um, and Even when to the I, detriment of oneself. Totally. Oh my God, my biggest Achilles heel. My biggest Achilles heel. So what role does music play in being at the service of a stranger, essentially, to you? I've had to retool that a little bit because, um, to segue into music, uh, <laughs> if you want to talk about it. Um, <laughs> whatever, we talk about whatever. Um, <laughs> let's start with your childhood. <laughs> <laughs> we should, but also like real talk. Yeah. It, it is all connected. No, no, it is. And you're, you've been doing this for a long time. Yeah. But it's about it is. First of all, 
it's paid off. But sis, like, I think you're about to get nominated for a Grammy. Don't say that. <laughs> well, I mean, I'll be that fucking asshole. Oh my god, you're gonna make me cry. I really, I if they don't, then the Academy's incredibly fucked up, and you need to oh retool yourself. But I'm telling you, like, real talk, like, I, you're on, you are doing something so amazing. Oh my god! But thank also, you. genuinely, you live. I, I'm gonna cry. Like, you, you live so transparently. Thanks. And honestly with people, you are so yourself, you share what's going on in ways that people are afraid to do. So I really appreciate that. I admire you very heavily. Thank you. So, so Not us crying. <laughs> Walked in crying. Middle, still crying. If people just fast forward, they just see like a slew of We're just crying. us crying. Jesus Christ. <laughs> I, I, and also, you're incredibly fascinating. Thanks. Thanks. You have... Uh, I want to get into music, but you yeah. have a, you also have a deep attachment to poetry. Yeah. I mean, Edgar Allan Poe's dark as shit, sis. You, okay, <laughs> sis. <laughs> sis, hey, let's talk about this. You know, um, yeah, I I used to have a really, well, no, I still do. I So my grand, I think, I, I don't know if you read this, but my grandfather gave me this like really, really, really old copy of an original uh, like collection of Poe poetry and it is like destroyed. Like it is just this, like, I think it used to be a mint green. It's like a dark gray and it's um it's like my most beloved book and I bring it with me everywhere. I used to have like the, the you know, like my favorite pages, I think like 23 is Annabelle Lee or something. It's like, it just... No one can top him except for maybe like the only other man that can like really compete for me around that era is like Oscar Wilde. Those are like mm. my two hands down favorite. So after reading Edgar Allan Poe, do you start writing poetry yourself? Um, I honestly, I think more so my mom was a poet growing up. Oh, cool. So that was probably much more, you know, like yeah. the influence for me. But when does that turn into writing a song? Um, not until very recently. I think I had told myself that poetry and songwriting were just like oil and water for some reason. Like I just felt like they lived in two very different mediums. Mm. Um, and I think the idea of writing poetry for me was so about writing with a non-critical eye and for myself. And I think I had like, okay, let's just... <laughs> Let's just get real. Um, everything before this has been fake is what I'm saying. Uh, just to be clear. No, but I I, uh, I think poetry, I have a very, very um, tentative relationship with my public image. And I think for a long time, the way that I viewed like the sort of like faceless mass of the public was uh, with great fear, like uh, immense fear. Um, and not really for any reason other than I think I was a highly traumatized child. Um, and then suddenly I had, you know, I had severe social anxiety and I don't think I really put two and two together that like, cause I grew up in the theater. Like I was all about the, the um, camaraderie mm -hmm. of performing. And I don't think I really knew at the time when I was 14 that like pursuing the energetic connection with like an audience and with cast members and with other musicians would really lead to a life that was much more like alone on the top of a hill. Something that is the most, something that is the deepest of community turned into something that could be the most isolating. Yeah. And I think, I think like because I already have like a tendency to isolate as like my coping mechanism for mm -hmm. feeling unsafe um it's really been difficult for me to not feel because i also think like i think a lot of people don't really understand the way that trauma sits in the body is like a really animal thing it's like highly physical it's really kind of nonsensical and illogical on a lot of levels but on some levels incredibly logical like when you experience a lot of like short notice traumas or like, you know, surprises, your nervous system gets primed to expect those things. And so for years, I would have this really irrational response to people recognizing me in public, which was like this overwhelming panic and almost like like I would like withdraw into myself and I'd like burst out in tears and I it didn't make any sense. And people were upset by it and I like didn't know how to control it. Um, because I just felt like my nervous system was like just going off, like mm. alarm bells were ringing, ringing because I didn't know who these people were, but they knew who I was. Um, and I've been able to tackle it since then, but like for years it was something that I was like petrified of. Um, 
how do you channel all that energy and emotion? I think suppressing it, which was not the right thing to do, but I think it was the only thing I knew how to do at the time. So I was like a really, really anxious person to be around for a long time. And I think that kind of manifested in a lot of people in, you know, like watching me not really knowing who I was because I didn't really know who I was. And I was just like attempting to hide and not feel so exposed and not feel so unsafe and just like patch myself up and keep going and get through the work day and like you know, I was working as much as I possibly could to avoid being home alone in my bed thinking about my life. Um, and so because of all of this, I developed this weird, like, fear of an audience. And not like a literal audience, because I actually feel like on stage is one of the places I feel safest. Um, but I developed a strange kind of, like, fear with being perceived mm. i guess is the best most universal way of putting it and when you're solo on your own you're going to be the sole person that's being perceived right there's no sharing that perception sharing that spotlight with another human being right and as well like i think when i'm i'm actually at my best when i'm in conversation with people and i think a lot of people who might not understand who i am because i am a bit guarded they're always surprised to see me speak with other people mm. because they're like, oh, you actually, you really like people. And I'm like, I love people. It's just me when I'm on my own that I work the least like well-oiled machine when it's just me. Well, you serve at the altar of people. It's true. It's so true. When you're making records, which yeah. by the way, boyfriend, breakfast, bad idea. Are you making these songs for others or are you making it for yourself? That's that's something I'm also tackling right now. Um by the way, you can bill me at the end for this therapy session. <laughs> um, uh, that's something I'm also figuring out right now because I wrote Boyfriend thinking no one would ever hear it. You know, that's like the classic thing. And I was like, this is just for me. This like fucking smacks. Like, I love this. I'd listen to this all day long. And I was like, people are going to hate this. Like, bleh, whatever. Um, it's. I was like, I was, and I was also like kind of worried because that was... A, the, there's so much to talk about, but that was a really interesting experience for me because I had always been kind of quietly queer mm. <laughs> because I really was nervous, again, fear of the public, that like people would just not believe me that I was queer. I know that's like a crazy thing to be afraid of, but in this day and age, people are so angry. People are so um, loud and... Uh, and they want an intense definition. It's like, what does queer mean? Right, and I, I wasn't sure I was... I was knowledgeable enough. I also felt like I was always kind of like on the outskirts of the queer community because, you know, I, I grew up with people. It's hard. It's hard to know your identity as a human, as a young girl, when you're in the public eye, when you are self-hating. Like, I was just so unsure until I reached a point where I was like, I am... I mean, I dated girls growing up, so I don't know how I could have possibly been unsure, but I just, I wasn't sure I was knowledgeable enough to share that part of me with the world. I think I felt like there was this inherent pressure um, to speak on it in a way that I wasn't sure I knew myself enough to speak with authority. Um, and so I was afraid to release that song. And then I think it actually ended up being the catalyst for me to understand myself so much better um and so i think that's like a really beautiful thing like whenever somebody tells me they have like a personal connection to the song i'm like so do i as if like i wasn't you know what i mean you it's like it just it, feels yeah. equal like the yeah. two of us meeting in the middle of this like little time capsule song so cool it's incredibly special right so special but also in that moment and you releasing that song you then go some you you do go through some sort of a journey of understanding who you are. Yeah. Is that wrong? Because you, again, you've been incredibly honest yeah. and the most open. And you've talked about struggling with your concept of self. Yeah. So, and you go as far as talking about how you covered up mirrors. Yeah. I have people I care about very deeply in my life who yeah. experience that at all stages of their existence, some mm -hmm. incredibly early on. Yeah. That's, that's so hard. <laughs> yeah. It's, I can't, imagining it is not even, does it's not even a tenth of the actual pain. Yeah, for sure. So, thank you for sharing that. Of course, thank you. But do you, do you have a version of yourself today? How do I, you see? 
yourself? I actually don't. I'm not sure. Um, it's funny that you bring that up. I was just writing a song last night about mirrors and like the kind of like relationship to um, identity that like image should have and, and shouldn't have and like all these things. I, I saw a quote the other day that was like, <laughs> and again, I'm like very, very self-aware of how everyone's going to perceive this coming from me, but um, I saw a quote that was like the biggest, I'm going to butcher this, but the biggest mistake of the modern world is like mirrors and cameras and our sense of self-perception. Like if, if, if we hadn't done that, like how much further along would we be? And like, how much does that fuck with our experience? It's like, it takes you out of the present moment. I mean, there's so much to talk about with the image and the self. There's so we could talk about it forever. Um, but I definitely think that like, I definitely think that it is one of the biggest plagues and and I'm admitting like it's one of my biggest plagues like I'm not above it at all like it is something that torments me is like perception of the self awareness of the self it's like a it's like a sickness it is a sickness and and it seems so normal that like we forget that it's actually incredibly toxic to be this aware of ourselves and to constantly have this kind of third person view and and it's like everybody these days especially is so aware this generation with obviously social media phones like buzzword buzzword but like even even down to having mirrors like my, my best friend and I, we usually spend the holidays together just to like survive it. <laughs> We're like, whose family? Which, which holiday? Um, and uh, she, she started to get into this thing where she would, we would go and like do our skincare routine. She'd turn off all the lights, and I was like, dude, I can't fucking see. I was like, what am I gonna do? Like, I have to wash my face. She was like, she like got really mad. She's like, you don't need to see your face to wash your face. And I was like, that's not true. What if I like need? To? And she's like, you don't need to look at yourself. Stop fucking looking at yourself. You're obsessed. Every time you walk past a mirror, you look. And I was like. It's such a fucking coping mechanism to always be aware of how you're being perceived and 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 to be like heading off people at the past and like be defining yourself like and and some of it can be fun like some of it is not worth demonizing some of it like I think that if you're in a healthy space I find it like experimenting like you know I bleach my eyebrows all the time I change my hair color all the time I change my makeup drastically to look like a hundred different people I have tooth gems I play with my height like image expression like if you go like some of my favorite all-time like fashion icons and image icons are like Bjork David Bowie like you know FKA Twigs like people who are always messing around and distorting and going towards the alien and experimenting with what it means to be a human being like a lot of it is really not that serious and it's really fun and like if we can just know that like we are a cardboard box and we're just like here to decorate it and have fun and then we die when we die and we peace out like it's not it's not that serious it's not that personal the problem is when was when it gets distorted and it takes up too much space in your brain and it becomes personal and it's really fucking hard to avoid that these days with social media and how much image is pushed. And I am so, so in deep with it. Like I am being mentally aware and being like cognizant of, of having that issue does not absolve you from the issue. And um, I need to, it's like something I'm actively working on. But it, 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 it's something that is a process. Yeah. But also there is always going to be a deep desire to what you see in the mirror match who and what you feel inside and in your brain and right, to be but able I, to express that. But I do think that because I am so aware of that and everyone is so aware of that, I actually think it is an impetus to me matching it with my insides. Like, you know, on mm. the days that I feel... And it's... I get it. It's very strange. Like, I, th I think that it's... I, I can feel this, like, peripheral knowingness of, like something that I haven't been able to define yet and I don't know what that means like I feel like if I even begin to finish that sentence people leap to conclusions I don't know what that means I'm not implying something and, and hiding you, it and you don't need to know and I don't need to know but I I do think that like you know I'm, I'm in a space right now where I'm ready to attempt to move some stones around in the garden and like figure out what's underneath and and then work from there because I haven't been in a space where I was ready to confront all of the things that I piled onto myself to cope with pain, 
which is really so much of what people are doing these days is they are just using stimulus and external stuff to pile themselves over as like stones, like they're covering themselves because it's painful to be alive. That is so incredibly true. Yeah. Do you find that music is this in between where work crosses with this ability to also release? Yeah. Well, also maybe suppress, but hopefully less suppression and more of a release. Yeah, definitely. I think that like, I think that that my my strange little experiment that's happening right now this year, which is all of this music, which really does feel like a fun little forage. Like I'm like, let's see what happens if I do this. Sister. Yeah. Come on, this uh, is fucking crazy. <laughs> it's so fun. It's like, I feel really, really grateful to be in a position to be able to experiment like this and like, I don't know. I, I, I mean, like, I'm one of those people where I'm like, sometimes I wake up and I'm like, I can't believe I'm alive. So then like, to then be able to do this is like, height of heights. But I think, but the song yesterday, like that, that is in line with where you're looking to go in your life. Yeah, no, it's true. And, and, and I think that that's like, to go back again, 20 minutes ago, when I, when I didn't think anyone was going to hear Boyfriend, I was probably writing from a much more honest place. Yeah. And I was even talking to one of my best friends last night and I was like, cause I, I think I, I think I'm going to delete Twitter okay. and I, and I think I'm going to wait. I got a flip phone. I'm going to switch to a flip phone for a while. Wait, shut up. Yeah. That's I found like amazing. a little like nineties, like <laughs> matrixy flip phone. I got a separate number for it. It's really cheap. And I think probably really shitty. <laughs> I think it's like one of those, like you have to like one, two, three, C. Um, and I'm going to, you know, just kind of like. Not And it's like, I don't mean it in like a pretentious, douchey, like, mm, you know, like off the grid, but I just, I know it's really bad for me. Yeah. I can Good. totally recognize that it's joyless for me at this point. And I think it actually doesn't match up with who I am. Like the way that I use social media is very misleading. And I think that when you talk to me, it's like two different people. And I'm really not interested in that. And I'm not interested in perpetuating that, but I don't know how to stop. So I like, I have to just like get the fuck off my phone and I have to like starve myself of things I'm genuinely addicted to. Um, like in the way where it's like, you're not even enjoying it. It's just compulsory. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's that, totally yeah, fucking compulsory. That's healthy. You need to do a hard reset. I need to do a hard reset. And I need to like take care of myself because God damn it, am I unhealthy? <laughs> like my skin is like sallow. Like I'm like all kinds of like weird puffy. Like I need to just like be a human being. And then I know, I know, I know that this album's going to fucking smack. <laughs> I was just going to say, like, like, cutting all this shit out yeah. will bring you back to where you were making Boyfriend, yeah. which is forgetting that maybe, maybe yeah. someone else may listen to it. Right. Like, that's... Right. Cutting out that noise. Totally. No, and, and also, to be fair, like, I love, I love Breakfast and Bad Idea. I oh, just I just also know that I was writing those it, from a very different headspace, like, probably from a more protected headspace like just something with a little bit more of awareness totally and i just need like i i think i'm i might even like i mean my label's not gonna like hearing this but i like <laughs> i'm like i might just like go somewhere for two months and ghost everyone but i think i might you should yeah i think i might like maybe not two months because they, they they would find me and kill me but <laughs> wouldn't go over well you're but using I, the same producer right for everything Is yeah i work mainly with yeah evan blair he's so He's so talented. Fucking crazy talented. Yeah. No, like, he's the best. Did he? So he did Boyfriend? Did he do Breakfast? Yeah. Did and Bad, Bad Idea. Idea. Yeah. Yeah. I actually, I can't say what this next song is yet, but um, I have a new song coming out pretty soon that is a duet, actually. And that'll be my first time I've ever not worked with Evan in this new venture. But I can't say what it is yet because we're not quite done. But I'm, I'm very excited well, about that as well. Okay. So... Uh, Let's. Uh, can I ask some like hard, like music questions? Yeah, and I'll go rapid fire. <laughs> <laughs> rapid fire. What's your favorite color? If you were a sandwich, what sandwich would you be? Oh um, shit! No. <laughs> In depth. Whoa! Don't get crazy. <laughs> please hold back. The, grab the tissues. Personal, please. <laughs> <laughs> how? So a song like boyfriend. How does it start? And is there? Have you figured out a pattern of how <laughs> these records like actually? Just that little seed is planted. So a lyric is a production and then you set lyrics to it. Is it a feeling that you just come into the studio with? Well, Boyfriend came from like a very impassioned recounting of a real story that happened where I was just like going off and off and off and off. Um, and and then I like ended the whole thing by being like, I mean, fuck, like I could be a better boyfriend than him. And we all went. 
And then it just like that was that was just the the seedling. Um, and then so we, a rant. Yeah, I was pissed. Passion. <laughs> I was definitely pissed um, at a man, as most really wonderful songs start in the same way. Um, but I, we also we had a we had a track we'd been working on that was those really aggressive descending horns in Boyfriend, um, and at first when we started writing Boyfriend, I don't think we stacked it over those because we were like this goes way too crazy to like, the, these horns are so aggressive. And then we were like, wait a minute, like, let's just marry the two. But at the time, going all the way back to Joker, mm. at the time, um, I had, it was the very first song I ever wrote with Evan. And we sat down like the day after I finished my little like baby mini black box theater tour. Um, and my voice was shot and I was like exhausted beyond. Um, and... I had just started working with him, so obviously I was, like, being, like, wildly, you know, like, when before you know somebody, you're like, bam, 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 bam. Like, I was just, like, throwing all this, like, manic, crazy shit at him, being like, this is everything about every person I've ever been in my entire life. Let's put it into a song. Um, before I was crying on his floor in a t-shirt and no makeup, being like, Lee Evan, I'm so tired. Um, but when we were first meeting each other, I was like, all right, post up. Here's we're, every night we're going to watch a different movie and you're going to watch it at your house and I'm going to watch it at my house. And then the next day we're going to write a song inspired by this movie. And it's a great idea because what you do is you get in the mindset of these villains and these characters. And we had this playlist. And so we would keep these like YouTube videos on of these different scenes that I would be inspired by and like get into the vibe. I love that. And so Boyfriend and that those descending. Um, that was inspired by the the staircase scene, the descending staircase scene in the Joker, um, mixed with the Moriarty scene from Sherlock when he gets out of the helicopter and he's listening to Break Free by Queen, and like all of these like very kind of queer coded like male villains that really influenced me growing up. Um, talking about identity and image, like. There was nobody who I related to more growing up than, you know, um, Dracula and like fucking Jack Sparrow and like all these like very kind of effeminate Men. male, male, female creature yeah. people, villains. Um, I was actually listening to the Annie Lennox love song for a vampire song on my way here and like cry. That was like my favorite song when I was eight because I was like, Dracula wants to be loved. <laughs> um, but like I just, all my songs, I, I'm so inspired by villains because I think the reason, and I think that the culture is really inspired by villains right now as well. And I think that the reason behind that emotionally is because the villain is just the protagonist who has been like highly traumatized. Yeah, like, it's like the how coin flip. Here, yes. It's the coin flip totally. of the character and we're fucking sick of the protagonist. Like there's nothing to them. There's never any texture. We don't relate anymore. Mm. We're also traumatized as a generation. I think that like the villain is the person that we're all like, shit, fuck, yeah, me too. <laughs> like, but you are not a villain. You were, <laughs> you were bullied in school. That's true. I, I didn't know somebody locked you in a closet for seven hours. That's true. What the fuck? People spilled chocolate milk down your dress. <laughs> you really did your research. That's fucked up. Yeah, but you know, I think I, I, I forget. I like definitely don't hold a grudge against anybody because like in that era, because first of all, <laughs> this is going to be dark, but like, but, I think my trauma's got a lot worse. <laughs> I yeah. kind of like, I don't care about the movie. <laughs> but I also, I also think like I knew from a young age and God bless my mom for this, but like, Whenever I, I, cause I was more so confused by bullying than anything else because I think I, again, and this is gonna sound made up, but like I really wanted to be friends with everybody. Yeah. I really loved people. Like I loved my peers. I think I maybe wanted to be friends with people too aggressively. Um, but I really couldn't understand the mechanism of bullying because it felt isolative and I was just such a lover that I, and not like a sensitive lover, like an aggressive lover, but I was somebody who so wanted to be friends with everybody and I was a total fucking weirdo. But, I didn't understand. I thought I felt like I would never have the impulse to bully because it would make people feel far from me. Like I just didn't get it. And so my mom one time when I was very young was like, but you have to know that in order for someone to cause other people pain, they have to be in pain themselves. And I think that was so informative for the rest of my life. Like I think about that totally. every single time I see somebody like throwing something energetically at someone like it, I don't even feel it because it's like I have never wanted to cause anyone pain like consciously and if I ever looked back and I was like oh my god why did I do that that was fucked up rarely um it was because I was in like immense pain yeah. and I didn't even know what I was doing and I think that's why like I don't even it doesn't even bother me 
I very much identify with that. Yeah. yeah. I totally understand that. Hurt people hurt people. And then we should have compassion for them. Like, and that, well, I mean, also then going back to like loving people too much and having that be the thing that's bad for you. Like, I do think that that is one way that that can backfire is being like, oh, I empathize with you so much that I end up like spending being time with people you. who are very bad for me. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, you don't realize or you know, but don't choose to let it come into clear focus that that person that you have empathy for is actually de- de- degrading and, and t- tearing you down. And you want to heal them. Like, there's a yeah. part of you that's oh, like, yeah. you know, no, don't be disconnected from yourself. Like, let's get on the other side of this. And then you're oh, like... I love a project. Uh, yeah. And then you're like, it's been four years. <laughs> I'm like, where did that time go? Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we just said energetic handshake. Yeah. yeah. We're meeting in the middle. We said, oh, yeah, I know that. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> so you get to really, well, well, how many songs do you have just sitting on a hard drive? Dump? Oh my God, so many. Shut I mean, up, like, really? I, I think like probably, probably like 10 that I really, really love. All with Evan? Yeah. All of them except for like two. Wow. Yeah. That's really, that's really special when you find a it's relationship so like that. I know. And he's also like my bestie. Like, like that's, we and- travel together. We like do stuff. Anybody who goes like, you're going to watch a movie with me from your house yeah. every night oh, and yeah. he does it and he sticks I mean, with it? I was it? being a little bit of a dictator about it. I was, it. I was like, I don't care what you're doing tonight. You're actually watching Charlie's Angels. <laughs> 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 but we, that's like how you become besties with somebody. I love him so much. Oh my God, yeah. And you get on that same wavelength and you're able to craft songs like this that yeah. sound from the same cloth but get better as they go down. Thank you. Like really, truly, Thanks. they they sound like you. Thanks. But each song is an evolution and a step in a, 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 the right direction. Thank you. It's fucking wild. Thank you. It's breakfast is amazing. Thanks. It, where is that born from? Is that born from a passionate pl- uh, speech again? Um, actually, I think it was. Yeah, <laughs> I, was, I was like, well, because the thing is, like, I come into the studio so much, and you can probably feel it. Like, I talk this way with everybody in my life. I like, I it. we just like brrr, all day long, and. That's why I think I'm actually really bad at sharing who I am on social media because I feel so intimate with the people in my life. And then I look at my phone and I'm like, oh, fuck, like, Jesus, like, I have to, like. And so I think I come across as very, like, on socials because I'm literally not supposed to be doing it. <laughs> like, somebody else has to do it for me because I, uh, I'm just I'm so much better in person um, than I am about, like, marketing myself. But. Anyway, I... By the way, you're doing a pretty good job. Oh, like You have, thanks. like, 50 million fucking followers. I know, but like, here's the, the thing. Like, let's just be what do you, honest. What do you have like, to market yourself? They don't fucking know who I am. Like, oh, they're, they're following gonna... me because they like my makeup or some shit. Like, you they're, know... They're going to watch this and get a better idea now. Maybe. I hope. Yeah, unless they're like, oh, she's, like, so annoying. Like, <laughs> you know? The, the, she talks? Yeah, I know, exactly. Oh, my God, I didn't... I actually, somebody true. came up to me one time not too long ago, and I, like, nearly had a panic attack. They were like, oh, my God, you're from Instagram. And I was like... <laughs> Mm-hmm. Oh. <laughs> I am and they're like I love your Instagram and then someone was like dude she's a singer and they went oh my god I really just thought you were cute and I was like fuck oh, me Jesus dude Christ. fuck me it's like but see that's the thing is it's like I'm, I really need to learn and I think it's I do think it's like a um, a fear of myself like I'm just really bad at sharing I'm happy to hear you think I've been really honest because I'm like it's really hard for me to be really vulnerable on socials because I'm just scared of people like I love people more than anything and I'm more scared of people than anything I get that which I think kind of go hand in hand together sometimes like the things that you like revere are also the things that you're the most terrified of I amen (laughs) women (laughs) what we're talking about is women (laughs) um but yes so I I came into the studio and I was ranting about a, a boy um very well, specifically a boy okay and it, i was it was about like i just i, I think um i was in a i was in a position where i had been speaking to and spending lots of time with a boy and it like dawned on me one day that he like thought i was an idiot like I like woke up one day like a vampire and i was like he thinks i'm an idiot <laughs> i had to like go to the studio to like rectify it what, well you know what 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 prompted what? this realization um i think i just realized that uh i was so enamored by this person because i just i tend to like really fall into people mm. um 
both like romantically and you know aromantically what is that platonically <laughs> um but i i just become so enamored and so in love with like there is nobody who's in my life that i like half love i like worship i know everything about them i keep lists on them like i am a lover and i was so obsessed with this person not even like in a serious way where i wanted to date them but we were like casually seeing each other um, and I was just like, wow, like I just wasn't seeing all the crazy amounts of red flags because I was like, he's so smart and like the way that he this, this and this and all my friends were like, you're making this person up. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and I was like, don't say that. You don't know him. Like, I know him. Like, I was just doing the whole thing. Um, and hopefully I've run out of that juice, but I was doing that for a minute and, and I woke up one day and I realized we had only ever had conversations about him. Like, I literally, I was like, I don't think this person knows a single fucking thing about me. Because I don't volunteer stuff about me because I'm so into the other person all the time. I am the same exact way. And then one day he, like, said something to me that was so crazy. Like, I think my mom, like, got married. And she did get married, I don't think. She did get married. Um, But she got married and I had spoken about it, like, ad nauseum. And I saw him a few days later and he was like, how was your mom's birthday? And I was like... (laughs) Oh my god, you don't give a shit about me. I was like, you truly just don't give a fuck. And like, it was all kinds of like little things like that where it was just like so clear he only wanted one thing, you know? Like, it was just one of those situations. And I was just like blind to it because I just really thought the world of him. Um, And I tried to speak to him about it and he like immediately shut it down and whatever, whatever. And so I went into the studio and I just started talking about this kind of like, what is it about like being kind and loving to this type of person Mm. that that like um dehumanizes you in a way it's like you become a function of their stratosphere and their you know you begin to orbit around them and then they like stop seeing you as a full person what is that like i just i can't i can't wrap my head around that because the more someone shows me their humanity the more i like idolize worship like i just don't get it that mechanism can't work for me in my brain by the way i when, when's your birthday? January 15th. Okay. What it was, what's your sign? I'm a Taurus. I'm a Capricorn. We're best mm, friends. I fuck with you. I fuck with you, dude. I'm the same exact way. Yeah. And my biggest fear is getting, you describe it so well by saying you're just in somebody's orbit. Yeah. I see it more as like, same exact concept, but being just so consistently kind to somebody yeah. that it just is more of like a, of course, yeah. as opposed to a... No, thanks. How are you? Yeah, like prioritizing someone so much that then they they de- they dehumanize you. Like that's really what it is. It's like if you break the mechanism down, they are they have stopped seeing you as a human with autonomy, and they have started to see you as a function of what works for them in their life. And and like yes, of course, like that's like tale as old as time. We all know this. Um, but it it really is such a a heartbreaking mechanism because it just means something really shitty about those humans mm. that you don't want to think like because I because you know we're saying that the more anybody prioritizes me and uh, shows me their soft spots, I I'm love like, you more mm, forever. Let's go on trips together yes. and get tattoos. I'll like, die for you. I'll fucking die for you, if dude. We, if you share, yes, yes, yes. yes. If you show me the. Sh- Yes, yes, right? yes, yes. And so then if you like reverse it and you reverse engineer it, you're like, oh my God, we are fundamentally from different fucking planets and you are never going to see me the way I see you. How did I get myself into this position again? And then I like Wait, had what was to- the sign of this person? I just need to know, just for reference. What's your sign? No, what- Sagittarius. Okay. He's- oh, I shouldn't have said that. Why? Never mind. He's an air sign. He's a generic air <laughs> sign. <laughs> It's just like, you know, ne- I never want to say any personal details about somebody. But, <laughs> so, so, <laughs> but wait, we're besties so, here. So, wait, so the, the month that they're born is like a person? Yes, because I don't date anybody. Wait, like when I, I say month, I, I mean, it's equi- equivalent. Op- <laughs> the, the, yeah. Their star sign is essentially yeah, well, their social security listen, number. Listen, I'm a girl. That means like somebody could cross-examine this shit and know exactly who we'll, I'm talking we'll about. Delete her. No, no, no. But it's but it's Air true. Sign. It's it's um, it's um, uh, it's like a fundamental difference. And so I had to go to the studio And I had to be like, because also I think the thing that really bothers me about that, and I think a lot of women specifically are going to relate to this, everybody, but also like I know that a lot of girls who I speak to about this feel the same way. When you become soft and and committed and caring and doting and romantic and Mm. celebratory for someone... It's because you're doing that on purpose. You're offering that to them. You are you are giving them something you don't give to everybody. And I think a lot of women, 
you know, I think a lot of a lot of in, in, in like heterosexual couples specifically, just speaking about this because this is the situation. Um, a lot of men expect that of femininity. And so they forget like I am I am an incredibly fiery, tough, scary. Like if I if I want to be like, you that's can. not like my mode of operation all the time. And so it was like something that I was, you know, kind of like that. That was like how I felt I was showing him I felt safe with him. So then when I got like pissed off about it, I was like. God damn it. Like, I can't believe I let this person in in this way. And like the disrespect of not even giving me the time of day or caring about me in any sort of real way where you even see me as a full individual, like that's over for me. And I and so I I was like upset that I even could have done that to myself because really I did it to myself. Like I let somebody in who I shouldn't have. Um, But then I had to I had to write a song about this person who's like playing this character of like you know, this like big machismo, like your smoke in my hair, hot and dirty, like the LA air, like that face, it ain't fair, but you don't know what you don't know, which is like, you don't know shit, you know fuck all. Like you're an idiot. And I was the one who let you into my life and and I actually could eat you if I wanted to. (laughs) (laughs) Listen, it's not a... (laughs) I didn't say I was writing poetry. <laughs> it's fucking amazing. But, no, but it's, you know, it's because a you could, song, you but. could eat them. I mean, not like cannibalism, but you could verbally <laughs> and emotionally destroy them if you need it. Well, and I don't ever like that's not my motive. Not, of course. That's it's not, not my thing. But it's just like annoying when someone underestimates you and then you lose yourself in it. I'm the same way. Because oh, then you God. like you. I totally am one of those people where I want to be soft for someone. And yeah. then when you regret it, you regret it. Oh, and I when, and if you hurt me, like I will hold grudges. I will never that talk. That is very Taurus of you. I have no fucking problem never talking to you fuck again. Oh, see, that's where we're different. Oh, I, if you... I'm like, I will never speak to you again. And it's been like five days. And I'm like, I just want you to know that I didn't mean that. And I love you so much. And if you ever need anything, I'm hopping no. on a plane. Like, <laughs> If it's grave grave, that's crazy. Well, <sighs> like, yeah, but if they like really, like that, if that guy yeah. pops back in your life, you're not going to go. You're not oh, gonna, no, 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 no. I think there's levels at which you can hurt. And yeah. like, my receipts have different lengths, you know? No, no. My receipts have different <laughs> lengths, honey. A bar, a word. Um, no, it's true. But I, I also, I think I tend not to take, like, I think I've, I don't really take anything personally. Like, I, I totally know that that's my thing. I got myself involved with someone like that. And that was my own kind of, I'm writing another song right now about self-harm actually not literally self-harm but like the things that we self the ways in which we self-harm that are like secret and sneaky and how my relationships have been like a form of self-harm in the past like a self-flagellating behavior because i didn't believe i deserved real love um and at the end of the day you can blame the person who is bad to you you can you can be mad about everything that they did and and that is valid like when people mistreat you they mistreat you and that's on them right like i'm not saying that i take responsibility for things that were done to me but i was i was personally complicit in choosing those people because it was like a deep-seated belief that i had that i didn't deserve a real partner and i was like trying to win someone over who i recognized was bad for me Mm. um because i wanted to prove to myself that i was like worthy of winning love and that's something i've like very much grown out of now um worthy of winning love yeah yeah, like I think a lot of people who have trauma, and also I think it's just common even beyond trauma, like it's not all about trauma. I think a lot of people will put themselves in a position to chase unattainable people so that they, and even if you attain these unattainable people, they are emotionally unattainable. And the reason that we do this, I think there's a lot of reasons, but my my reason specifically was I didn't realize I was acting out this deep-seated belief that like, who I was at my core was not worthy of being loved. Like, I am unworthy of love. I'm like a gross sludge monster, self-hatred, you know, gabagooly scary thing. And I have to, like, cover myself with all these, like, pretty rocks to make sure nobody knows I'm a full-blown freak. And so I was choosing people that, like, really didn't like me (laughs) uh, because I didn't like me. And if I proved that I could win them over and be good enough for people, then I could finally be good enough for myself. And sweet Jesus Christ, I think you're dying. Like, I, I need mean, this is <laughs> we're both paying each other. I, this yeah, is a therapy session this is, for everyone. This is, <laughs> this is cr- I'm gonna start sweating, <laughs> Destiny. Yeah, woo, it's hot, a word, but you know, I think that like <laughs> I'm gonna start sweat crying. <laughs> it's, a, it's a sweat lodge in here, you guys. Uh, this is actually, a, yeah, this is a very complex, in depth torture device I'm employing here. Um, I, I keep going because you're oh god, fuck, yeah, <laughs> I just think that like. 
I think that, you know, there's obviously when you find yourself in patterns, you have to go like, what is it that I am seeking out of this that I am unable to give to myself? What what would really happen if I were to give myself the things that I'm seeking in these people? And also, like, you know, it's the same thing as when you are looking for a solution to the problem, but you keep not finding it for a long time. You have to ask yourself why don't I want to find a solution to this problem? And it's not all things, of course, like I always have to make a disclaimer when people are like, well, what about this? It's like, well, it doesn't apply to everything. But there are some things in my life that I was not getting past. And I couldn't give you an example, but like, you know, just like perpetual issues. And I had to ask myself one day, what would happen if I let go of this problem? And the answer was almost always like, I would have to face the fact that like maybe I'm enough for myself and I was like no <laughs> like it was like falling down a well or like you know I'd have to face the fact that like my dad did die I'd have to face the fact that like my friends my two best friends did die I'd have to face the, pa- the fact that like there has been abuse like I would have to face those things and I was de- I was like deferring on my own healing because And like filling it with all of these mini problems. And this is another thing. I used to talk to somebody who was very important in my life about a certain conversation about existential dread. Not everything. I think existential dread is like human and intrinsic and inborn. And like, I don't think it's necessarily avoidable. And there's a million different kinds. But this specific conversation we were in was this thing where like every time we would get close to talking about something really touchy, Mm. their brain would go, well, but why are we even here? And I was like, okay, we have to look at the fact that you are obsessing about a problem that you'll never find the answer to, that no one has ever found the answer to, that is unanswerable because you have told yourself you can only heal on the other side of something completely unattainable so that you can never heal. It's so true. It's so fucking true. We give ourselves all, and it's very human. Like, I do this. I do this. You give yourselves these roadblocks so that you can never reach healing because if you were healed, it's like your ego is terrified of being like, well, then where do I go? Yeah, what do you do now? What do I do? Who would I even be? And the, the funny thing, the joke of the whole conversation, and I've experienced this in small ways, and it's, you know, life is cyclical. And I don't believe in the new levels, new devils, but I do believe in new levels, new levels. Mm. And in, in the times where I've been really in flow and really in touch and healthy and all these things, the joke is that when you finally overcome like a certain ego conversation saying like, if you give up the ghost of this, this and this, you'll cease to exist. The joke is that like the ego is actually an inside job and it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy like it's feeding you like conspiracies to keep itself like at the forefront of your of your brain of the conversation of like the lizard activation brain oh, yeah. and when you successfully have like a small little victory not that things can be quantified like that always but like when you finally have like a little cloud burst of like something kind of dissolves for you and you're like is this problem leaving my body like like a knot in a muscle <laughs> and i have had this happen before the ego like takes a little nap it's like it's like the thing that you're afraid of where you're like who would i even be is like right there anyway and the ego distorted version of you is like um you realize how constructed it is and you're not actually haunted by it for like a very brief amount of time and i would imagine that that's like what happens in a, in a very full way when you confront all of your like stories and narratives that you've made up which is obviously made very complex by trauma because your whole wiring is set up to tell stories and to see narratives on the horizon but um it's something that i'm like actively trying to kind of like untangle like headphones left in your pocket for too long because i just imagine on the other side of that is a freedom where I'm not terrorized by myself and then projecting it onto the world. So is therapy the goal to get there or is therapy managing everything with the eventual hope that you'll get there? I think that therapy for me, because I'm in a specific, well, I'm not right now because I'm an idiot, but uh, I, uh, when I do take consistent therapy, it's always trauma therapy yeah. where it's like, it's for me talk therapy doesn't work because as you probably have ascertained like I can psychoanalyze myself all day long and it doesn't <laughs> land right I'm like I know all the answers cry 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 um, I know all the answers lock myself in the closet um, <laughs> but why are we locking ourselves in the closet yeah yeah I know I came out of that thing a long time ago well, so, they locked you there for seven hours I know do you still sew by the way 
Sometimes. You started to do that when you were eight. Yeah. You know, I want to go back and take some pattern making classes because my one issue was I was too impatient to like stick with a pattern. I was always like, fuck, mm. you don't tell me what to do. And then I made like garbage because um, <laughs> I was using a pattern. Um, but I want to start again. But um, I did want to say that um, the, the trauma therapy specifically for anybody who is skeptical about therapy, it's life changing because PSA. Um, if, if anybody feels like reading a really dense book, Body Keeps the Score, it's famous for a mm. reason. Um, the thing about trauma is it lives in the body like in the same way that when an animal plays dead to avoid um, getting eaten by the animal that's pursuing it. Or like when basically an animal plays dead so that the bigger animal can pick them up and then when they put them down thinking they're dead, it can run away. That's like the whole mechanism. Mm. And we as animals ourselves have that same behavioral pattern, but we call it shock. So when somebody goes into shock and they're like, I don't even know, I don't even feel a thing. And like parts of their body stop working correctly. Trauma is incredibly physical because if you feel all of the emotion at once, it could take you out. That's why you hear about people dying two days apart from their spouse at an old age. You hear about people suffering hemorrhages and heart heart attacks and all these things. The body cannot keep up with the pain of all of those emotions uh, a lot. So you go into shock to preserve yourself. That means that all of the emotion that was coursing through your body at the time couldn't be processed. So all of that cortisol and all of those triggers are now like interlinked in places they shouldn't be. Mm. And you are kind of always like on the perpetual edge of, of like something, your, your body just deciding how you feel, which is why like people have panic attacks and they're like, I did everything to regulate myself before I got on stage. And it's like, you're not in the driver's seat, babe. Like something else is running the show. Um, and so trauma therapy is really great because it's talk therapy, but they get you into this state of what they call like, I think it's like, it always makes me laugh because I'm a child, but it's like semi arousal or something. And I'm always like, <laughs> don't say that because um, I'm five. Uh, but when they get like the trauma in a place where, you, oh, activated, that's what it is. Um, but they get you into a place where you're activated and then they like have, they almost always, it always shocks me, but she's like, okay, so, um, lower your shoulders and I'm always like twisted up like this and it's like uncross your legs what do you think about showing me your wrists like okay like put your hand like what do you want to do and basically you are letting your body intuit how you want to express because all of the emotion is stored physically uh. and it'll be like press up against a wall okay why do, and it's like horrendous <laughs> like you're like because you feel unsafe because your trauma's activated and then you're like doing all these like things that show your soft spots and your body's like panicking and it's fascinating as someone like to be just like aware while it's happening but 10 out of 10 would recommend for anybody who needs that because i do i'm really selling you on it <laughs> i know i'm like and my group on is I'm like, use code dove by the way i provide this service <laughs> go to my website <laughs> that's I, I, it's trauma, fascinating yeah I, I yeah i could probably use it and it's fascinating too because then it makes you aware of just how much everybody is interlinked like we could all be yeah we all run like little animals like i have so much empathy for people because i have empathy for myself and vice versa so a record like breakfast is bad i does it make what you went through in that relationship any sweeter or uh, hit a little different because the song actually hits resonates with people what bad idea or breakfast or breakfast uh yeah definitely i mean i it's funny too because even going back to boyfriend 10 years ago um <laughs> I, it feels like that. Uh, going back, that was like, that was taken from a night that was like really ugly. Like that night was like ending, like crying in an Uber. And it always makes me laugh that like, you never know looking back at like these, these nights where you're like, oh my God, I'm not going to fucking survive this feeling. Like sometimes those nights are the things that end up being like a weird little horcruxy, like X marks the spot for something really magical. Yeah. The shittiest moments could produce some of the most incredible pieces Bangers. of art. Yeah. <laughs> Shittiest moments, make bangers. Um, no, it definitely makes it sweeter. Definitely. And, you know, I mean, any anything... I used to date this guy who said something to me once where he was like, every song that I write is my way of processing it. Like, I put it in a little bottle and I put it on a shelf, which is then, like, I don't have to revisit it. And I was like, well, that's a problem. <laughs> I was like, you should still revisit it, though. Do you um, revisit when you perform these records? Yeah, definitely. I think I'm like... For me, it's the opposite. Rather than like 
encapsulating something and like trapping it like a little fairy I feel like I'm like opening up passageways in myself that like music this is like really lame but it's like music is like a free flow like little golden mm. thread between people who enjoy it and the person who wrote it so for me it actually feels like a little bloodletting or something I understand that yeah it's common but. A, a release yeah yeah a release and also like I have a I have a huge I get really self-conscious talking about like my pain or my life or my emotions or something because I think a I have a narrative that I'm a freak I think any everybody has a narrative that they're a freak it's like the most universal thing but b I think I I have this weird thing where I'm like I don't deserve to have sadness um and so I have this which is I also think like just like a um a common thing for people uh but I think writing music has actually helped me forgive myself a lot because when I put it into a song and I hear it, I'm like, oh, I, I'm able to look at it as valid or something. Um, well, and especially when people resonate with it, I'm like, oh, okay, so we're in this, we got this. Well, you're seeing it from a new perspective and then you're seeing other people be attached to it. You're realizing that you're not alone. Yeah. It's, I mean, it is incredibly therapeutic and special. Yeah, and I think it helps you stop hating yourself so much. Like, it's definitely done that for me. What are you thinking, Daniel? It's just been a great therapy session for you guys. I'm just here to make sure everything's running. <laughs> He's like, uh, I feel nothing. Um, I'm completely emotionally numb, but this has been nice to watch you guys. <laughs> yeah, I'm dead inside. Can't relate to you guys, but keep going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's like, I'm actually stable. So we're like, oh, what's that like? Um... Yeah, uh, you know, over there, he's Sagittarius. Sagittarius is like one of my all-time favorite signs. Yeah, you, thank you. Yeah, He says yes, agreed. What's your star sign? Yeah. Oh, wait, everybody's great in here. <laughs> what do you not like? I can't say that. What's it? <laughs> we have a Scorpio, I think, in the other room. Is that a November th November birthday? What is I think that is November. Or maybe September? Uh, oh, we, God, I don't know. I, I'm, a, I'm a Capricorn with a Scorpio moon and a Gemini rising, which is like a crazy chart. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, but I I, d I used to like be really anti Gemini because I had an ex who was a Gemini, and then my best friend informed me I was a Gemini, and I like 180. I was like, Gemini's are actually amazing. <laughs> I was like, now that I know that, you know what? Gemini's are creative. <laughs> Gemini's are social. Dan um, is uh, the opposite of me. Incredibly opposite. We don't have a single thing in common. Can you, you guys? tell? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's cute. You guys are like the odd couple. So weird. Like the super cute odd couple. Well, somebody new just joined our team, and they brought that up to me the other day. They were just like, "You, it's crazy that you've been doing this for eleven years together. You don't have a single. There's not a single thing in common. Nothing. That's cute. Not, it's no, hard. I think that's cute as well because then it's like the friendship is just organic. It's not like, sure. oh, I see myself in you, which is nothing wrong with that. But like, just vibe. That's cute. Do we vibe? <laughs> Depends on the day. <laughs> Oh my God, ladies, stop fighting. <laughs> Why'd you live in India for six months? Um, so that's actually, I don't know if I had said that um, specifically. I, and if I did, I was talking crazy. Um, I grew up with parents that had an import company out of India. Oh, cool. And so they would go to India for six months out of every year is maybe oh. the conflation. But so my sister and I started to travel with them because it was just like, why not? Yeah, yeah. And and I also I really didn't like school like every kid. Um and my parents were just crazy enough to be like, Well then fuck it, you don't have to go. Come to India. Yeah, they were like, you know what? She doesn't like it, so maybe she should just be homeschooled. Um But that's really I mean school culture to get a, a piece of. Yes, I know. It's something I actually don't talk about very much. Um but I we would go to Delhi, New Delhi, Jaipur, Jodhpur, Mumbai, kind of all over. Um and yeah, I would just like hang out on sample floors and marble cuttery floors and like stone cuttery. Sick. It was genuinely really, really amazing. And as well, I think like it's so like it's something I so plan to do with my children is just exposing them to as much of the world as possible. Because at a really young age, I came back to America after I think being there for like three months or something for the first time. And I remember experiencing my first bout of culture shock and just being like, whoa like um western culture is very very different and it, this is not what the whole world looks like and also you know i think i think experiencing poverty like seeing poverty yeah. firsthand as a child was something that i think is important like i, I remember thinking um when i was around eight or nine uh just how important it is for children especially 
in more privileged parts of the world to see that that's not the norm normal and also to see like because the children that i was seeing and like hanging out with in just like the neighborhoods that we were staying in they were all my age Mm. and um i don't even want to go into some of the stuff that i mean it's like it's heart-wrenching it's really really heartbreaking um but it's it's something that i think is so important for people to see because if you're not aware of um how insular the west is i think that it's really really hard to um I don't know, have have like a complete rounded out empathy, totally. feel involved with like worldly issues, understand your own privilege, like whatever. Yeah, all, all of it. Yeah. Is sticking within your bubble and keeping domestic to I your state I think that is the worst thing you country? can do for totally. yourself. You're like, limiting yourself. Totally. And also children are much more capable of holding um, things. To, like I remember I, I was in a conversation with uh, a brand when I was very young and I really wanted to work with a specific charity. And they said, ooh, we can't do that because parents don't want to show their kids that like they could go hungry. It's too disturbing for children. And I thought, that's so not true. Children are so capable of handling these big issues. And if you're doing that, you're breeding empathetic adults yes. rather than idiot adults who are like, well, I don't give a fuck what happens to so-and-so. Well, that's actually you cure problems. That's the whole fucking issue is that yeah. people don't know. And when they're in their formative <laughs> years, they're not exposed to people who like, there's it's it totally. breeds selfish people. Anyway. Yeah. It pisses a, me off like nothing else. Amen. Do you still have Stanley? Yes, I do. <laughs> you really did your research. <laughs> Stanley's my teddy bear. <laughs> Stanley's my really disgusting tattered teddy bear. Actually, my sister got me a new teddy bear last year because I am a child. Um, but th- it's not Stanley. It's it will nothing will ever be Stanley. No. You planted seeds that have grown into trees in Washington. Yeah. Have you gone back and visited these trees that apparently have intertwined with one another? Yeah. Where did you read that? I don't even remember saying that. That's so cute. We, we, what? Is this a Claudia thing? I mean, we, uh, we, have, <laughs> we have producers that do some great research. Oh, my God. Yeah, no, I um, I sometimes go back. I think for, like, many, many years it was hard for me to go back because it felt like a weird ghost town. Like, I was just like, Ugh, like, memories. But those trees live. But those trees fucking live, dude. No, there's a lot of it. Like, I go back and Washington is, like, the, the small island I'm from is relatively untouched and so it's it's nice like my best friend and I went back last year and we were able to like walk around the grounds of my childhood home and you know she was able to like kind of be a part of that that narrative that's really special no it is you still have your teddy bear you have trees that you planted when you were three that are thriving today yeah it's really nice it's true got a you know collection of lockets it's uh yeah no I I feel very lucky I for as much like strange like dark you have the right ties to the past i also still have like really magical pieces of the past yeah really cool thanks i want an album but uh i want you to also take your time (laughs) yeah you have 10 songs me too yeah i mean i think like i think my my goal is to have 13 because that's my favorite number that i really 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 love um and you know i think every time you bump it up like a new echelon you obviously like dethrone your previous songs right like that's always the thing is you're like this is the best and then you're like oh i fucking hate that now um (laughs) it's been like a month and you're like that fucking that was shit it was always shit um (laughs) but that's like what happens and so i'm trying to you know take my time i also you know it would be a debut album so i don't want to fuck it up i don't want to be an idiot right and just be like "Mm, it's good enough in the songs that you have now you have 10 are you realizing a story that's being told when you listen to all of them or you focus more on telling singular stories per song i think they're all singular stories i think that like i think because i'm like 100 different people in a day um I get very like focused in on like one thing, like the song that I'm writing about, like mirrors and my relationship with mirrors. Um, th- I started literally <laughs> this exact thing. I started to encapsulate. I had someone recently tell me, an ex of mine actually, um, that looking when he looks at me, it's like looking at a mirror, and it's he sees himself reflected back, like in a way that is like. Um, he meant it as a nice thing. Like he meant it as like a, you are so clean energetically that what bounces off of you is like the person who you're speaking to. Mm. Um, and he said, and I don't like myself enough yet to be able to be confronted with you. And I thought that that was so unbelievably profound and like a really astute understanding of 
how this person was triggered by me um, because he was like, you see me so well that I don't want to see me. And I'm like hiding from myself. And so I'm hiding from you. And like, that's why we can't be friends at this juncture. And I thought that was so fascinating and so true for this person. And so when I was writing the mirror song, I was like, oh, I wonder if this is actually the song about that because it's mirror, mirror. And then I was like, I have to compartmentalize those two ideas. Like, I can't just throw everything into one song. I think each song is its own emotional through line. Mm. And I could put so much into each one, but like, I want them all to feel so specific that like they are like one chord in your body. Totally. And I think that like that's that's something I really the the album might feel kind of all over the place for that reason, but I like that. I think that's like something I'm interested in doing creatively regardless, you know. I'm excited. Thank you. I, I mean, how many songs do you think you need to get the perfect 13? Well, I mean, I think that probably one or two of the songs I've released so far is going to be on the album. Right. Um and so the the stuff that I'm the stuff that I'm doing right now is incredibly varied. Like I've just started to fuck around with more ballads. Sick. Which at first I was very like, I hate a ballad. Never come at me with a ballad. What? Because I think I was just like didn't want to be vulnerable. And That's interesting. with myself, with myself. Um and then I started to write all of this like really depressive poetry. And I like read it to my mom. I was like, oh here's one I wrote because she's a poet. And I, I was like, here's one I wrote and I read it out to her and she's like do you really feel that way? And I was like, oh shit, I'm so fucking sorry. I should save this for myself and my therapist. Um, and then I was no. like, no, you know what? Like that's the kind of stuff that should that should find its way into music because that's the stuff that hits me the hardest is like the, the really ugly thing that you're afraid to say is always the thing that people are going to relate to the most. Um, that's it. Yeah, because it's like, it's that whole joke of universality is in the specific. Like the more specific you get, the more everybody's like, you wrote this just for me. And you're like, oh shit, we're really just all the same little monster. Scary, incredibly vulnerable, but ultimately healing and helpful. Absolutely. To you and to them. Well, because you know what it is, is it's without the truth, there's no life. Amen. And, you know, like when when you say something that's true, even if it's so, so awful to hear, it's always better than living in the sort of distorted reality of like what you wish was yeah. always better. Amen. A fucking man. This may go down as one of my favorite conversations ever. Oh my God. Thank you. So, I'm so happy. Like this was you. my dream. I've like always, always wanted to do this. And I like, but now I'm actually kind of sad that we have done it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, this was great if I could just like live in this last four days. <laughs> I, I really, truly, you're, you are so admirable, but you're so incredibly talented Thanks. and gifted. And this is, I know it's like a loaded thing to say, especially because we've been doing this forever, but like every day is just the beginning and whoever you are on that day i thank you for sharing that person and your art <laughs> and what you put out there it's really special and i i don't think there's another pop, like i don't want to call you pop star but you're, there's no other artist like you i mean that i'm not you are so nice around. to me no, i'm not fucking around thank you truly i think uh just being honest i think a lot of artists sometimes fall in a very fear of you know they fall into a heteronormative way of life mm. out of fear of just rejection or subjection or whatever yeah. it may be. And um, I just think there's not everybody's living their full and honest truth. And I think you're out here. I know you're out here living your full and honest truth. No matter how I just how stained our past may be, you've yeah. learned from it and you've become this incredible person and you put it all out there. Thank you. Really respect you and commend you. Really oh my truly. God. Thank you. Yeah, you're fucking awesome. You're fucking awesome. I'm like I feel like I didn't like ask you nearly enough about yourself. Shut the fuck like up. I'm like gonna come back and <laughs> you're not we're gonna flip that. the cameras. We're gonna flip the cameras. Okay. <laughs> you wanna say my <laughs> we're gonna flip the cameras. And then you're gonna be on my show. That's yeah, cool. And then I'll yeah, and then I'll ask you about your your album. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, come back for the album because do you have a date for this thing? No, I think I'm just working towards. I mean, listen, listen, listen. Take your time. I thanks. I'm gonna tell my label you said that. <laughs> I'm like Zach said. Yeah, take my time. Hello, Ron. Um, Perry. Hey, Ron, Mr. Perry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I think, I think that like it's gonna. I'm very big. I call this thing the click, and my best friend hates this. She's like the click's not real. The click doesn't exist. 
and I'm like, I live and die by the click. What um, is the click? The click is the thing that you feel in your nervous system when you know something's right and it's go time. And until you feel that feeling, you don't do it. Um, and I use this as like the principle for all big, scary calls in my life. Like okay. when I know I have to do something, I like put it on like a little like Rolodex of like, it, I, I picture it like little like boiling pots and it's like, okay, I'm going to put this pot on the fire and like, we'll see how long it takes. And then like the second I feel this little flip switch, it's go time. And I won't know what that is until I feel it. And it drives people in my life who work with me mm. crazy because they're like, we need a plan. And I'm like, you need a way for me to energetically feel it. <laughs> and they're like, they're like, fuck you. You're making this so impossible. I'm like, I don't give a shit. Um, so so but the it, click feels different every time? No, it feels the exact same every time. What but is it, it? How does it how does it come to you? I think it's like it's like this it's like this knowing. Like I have this feeling of like knowing that something is coming specifically. Like whether it's like a relationship is ending or you need to fire somebody or you need to have a certain conversation with a friend or you need to release your album or you need to make a difficult decision about your family, like whatever it is. You feel this thing coming and you're like, fuck, I'm not ready for that now, but I know it is coming. And then one day you wake up and your nervous system has done something magical and you feel the click. And that's going to be the day where I go, the album's done. <laughs> yeah, I'm serious. Like, I literally live and die by my fucking instincts. And it's... It's, it's done you right. Thanks. Right? But it also... You, you trust them. No, I really do. I really do. The only thing then is that, like, I kind of never know what the fuck is going to happen every day because I really live and die by being like, we're not supposed to do this today. And everybody's like, what did you fucking, like, feel the wind? And I'm like, yes, I did. I, yeah, I lay down and I just let the voices speak to me. Um but I think there's something about that because I do think that, like, as humans, we have uh, an intelligence that is completely illogical. Oh, yes. And totally instinctual and energetic. And I think if you go against it, oh, it there is nothing you will fucking regret more oh, than some call that you made because you thought it was a good idea, but you knew it was wrong. A story of my life. But I also think it takes, like, y y trial and error. To totally. Realize that this, it's, a, I, I do see as like a muscle sometimes because some totally. people choose to tap into it. Yeah. And some just choose to fucking ignore it. Totally. And then blame everything else for why something's wrong. Yeah. And also, like, I think that there are certain things that can dull you to it. Like, I I remember, like, you know, being in, like, like let's just, I mean, this is like a really, you know, intense example, but like being in a relationship where you're constantly gaslit. Like, you, you start to question your instincts because you are so trained to be like, Oh, I'm I made that up. Oh, I made that up. And like there are ways that we can get out of practice with it and there are ways that we can get really sharpened with it. And I think everybody has this voice, this knowing, this like magical connection, like little like antenna, like into the energy mm. world. <laughs> people oh, people are closing out of the video. No. They're like, oh, fuck this bitch. Um, <laughs> but I think I think there's something to that. And I think like it's and you know what I always use as like an example when someone's skeptical is it's like, have you ever walked into a room and you just thought, what the fuck is wrong with the vibe in here? Yes. That's your energy meter. And it's like, you know something's off, but you just don't know what. Or have you ever, like, you know, walked into, like, some place and you're like, ooh, haunted. It's like that same thing. It doesn't matter what you call it. We are energetic beings and you feel when something's right or you know when someone's lying or that same feeling when you feel someone staring at you. Mm, yes. There are all kinds of examples of this happening to people who are like, I don't believe in energy. And it's like, yes, you do. You just call it something else. Uh. And so if you get really tapped into that and you get really practiced with it, and I think you can kind of live your whole life by it. And that's something that I like definitely do. So when the click comes... So will the album. Yeah, exactly. Could be tomorrow. <laughs> I could just I could go rogue. I could just post all the demos tonight. Maybe I will. When it clicks. When it clicks. You have but a nice yeah. uh, crystal collection, I assume. No, I actually don't. Oh God, what? Yeah, I love that. That was the first time you spoke, and you were fucking wrong. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, don't ever speak again. Don't ever talk to me. No, <laughs> you really need to be quiet. Actually, um, you've been saying a lot, a lot loud over there. No, but um, you know what's funny? I I grew up with a mother that because she was a jeweler. She always very much educated me on the fact that uh, crystals literally do hold magnetic poles because that's what a lot of watches mm. used to be run on. They used to be run on quartz. Like there's a reason that, you know, they have they have certain poles. There are fields. If you if you check under, you know, I don't know, certain fucking machines, I'm not an expert, but like they give off a, something, an energy. They do like that's what runs old clocks. Um, so I believe in it. But. I don't think I believe in it in the way that like LA really believes in it. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not big on like, I don't judge anyone for it. I actually think it's kind of fucking sick, but I just energetically, 
again, I don't feel the click with crystals. I like, <laughs> I could put myself like, I, th- I think more so than anything, I believe in like little, um, like objects that hold special meaning for you. Yes. Not like good luck. Well, energy's in that too. Totally. Like, like I have certain things. Like my mom has this really, really old, like piece of silver that um, has been passed down. That was like people would pray over, Ooh. and so it holds all of this energy for all of this like people getting through really hard times. And I, I leave it be because. It's not, it's not, you know, I would never like degrade it down to something as simple as like, please let me do well on this audition today. Like, that's so fucking stupid, right? Um, That's like, you know, someone being like, I know that like God really helped me get this field goal. It's like, okay. He's like, nah, it doesn't care. Um, Personally, I don't think. But I think. But imagine he did. (laughs) Yeah. God has time for that. Um, But like, I I really believe that like, you know, in in times of great, great despair, or like needing guidance or something, I believe in the power of human beings. Oh, yeah. And I believe in the energy that they leave behind. Um, I believe in, you know, like especially an object or like, I think like old theaters hold this because of all the emotion there. I think like old churches, um, I'm not personally religious, but like I just believe that like the human expression stays. Oh yeah. And I think all of that energy output is so intense and you can connect with it. And I think like, in times where I have been like at my worst, like at my all time mental health lowest, like, you know, I'm trying to survive something. Um, I call upon things like that, just not even in a way of like, oh, give me something, give me guidance, but just like to know people have been here before. And I am, I am like on an energetic plane with people who have experienced also intense pain like this like there are people i'm not the first person to lose a bunch of people i am not the first person to experience you know you know uh, like suicidality like i'm not the first person i'm not and there's something in that for me that doesn't take away but it actually adds there's like a sort of for me there's a through line that makes me feel so connected to the human experience of these like objects where people have held in times of like great despair it's it makes me feel um like like i can walk that path yeah hope that they walked yeah, yeah for sure totally. and also just like i'm i'm held and i'm holding space like i don't know it, we're getting like crazy metaphysical now but i'm like if time and space are even real <laughs> uh but like you know i think there's like a meeting ground energetically for people that that is beyond time and space and for sure you can like you can hold on to that as the the permanent human condition that is beautiful Dove's got a cock. And- I know. They, you have- we're talking about talismans. <laughs> we're talking about... Guys, we're beyond time and space at this point. There's no yeah. there's no hope for us. Yeah, do Whatever's I- left on your schedule doesn't exist. <laughs> exactly. So time is made up about. so they can wait. But we can do a part two. Yeah, we can come back on for the album. Please, please, please. I will. You're always invited. You're really Dude. one of the famous people. Uh, my favorite people to sit on this couch. I really thank you thank for you. giving us your time, your energy, but also your honesty. That is... I really... Thank you so much. Thanks, man. And I ask you to listen to all of Dove's music, Boyfriend, well, Breakfast, A lot of it's been taken off the internet, so. Well, yeah, you are like just firing shots today. <laughs> he said, you must love crystals. <laughs> he said, I bet you have a lot of crystals. He said, <laughs> he said I don't know about pain, but uh, that's nice for you guys. <laughs> you know, listen to all of Dove's music on Amazon Music, fine. please. Doug Cameron, I love and appreciate you very much. You're a fucking rock star angel. <laughs> and you and I are going to have words. <laughs> we'll talk later. But we're great, and we're, we're besties. <laughs> Doug Cameron, Thanks, everybody. Guys. Thank you, guys.